warm and sunny feeling in our hearts today because it's opening day for the baseball season. That is so wonderful. It is another moment uh, to feel good, to feel a feeling of rebirth and recovery of the city moving forward, life moving forward. This would be a great day any year, but it especially feels great this year to have opening day happen, have it happen on time. Uh, this is an important moment. And I got to tell you, I've been thinking a lot about uh, opening day and what it means. And it reminds me of the things we got to do to make life better in our city. And, you know, we've had a real commitment in this administration to a universal approach. You know, one of the things I'm proudest of, pre-K for all. Now, as we talked about last week, 3K for all. The whole theme of our recovery, a recovery for all of us. We need big, bold approaches that are universal, that cover everyone equally. That's what we believe in. So today, uh, opening day, I want to announce a major new initiative. We're very proud of this. I think it's going to change things a lot. It's an important new initiative we call Designated Hitter for All. Designated hitter for all will bring justice and fairness and equality, something that's been long overdue. The era of the automatic out every nine batters will end once and for all. Uh, a pain, a challenge we've been dealing with for years. We're going to end the pitcher striking out as we know it and go to a bold new era. Now, this is such an important initiative for fairness, for equality, but it's also a recognition that we have to protect New York City's most precious asset, Jacob de Grom. Jacob de Grom must be protected at all costs, and having him go out there to hit, that's just a formula for an injury. And, and the Mets are going to need him, New York City's going to need him. So designated hitter for all ensures that Jacob can have the kind of season that he's capable of having. That could, that could be a very big deal for the New York Mets and for all of New York City. Now, this idea, this we all know what it means, more offense, more hitting, more displays of awesome power. It is going to be something that will fuel a recovery, a recovery for all of us. There's no question. Seeing the ball leave the ballpark because there was an actual hitter who could hit out of the ballpark, that's exciting. That's going to recover. That's going to fuel a recovery. That's going to create real energy in this town. I want you to know this is such an important initiative that it's already receiving crucial bipartisan support. And from a true Met fan, I want to present to you now the borough president of Staten Island, Jimmy Otto. Borough president. Yeah, uh, Mayor, bear with me one second. Just give me a minute. I'm breaking down some really important video of Clayton Kershaw striking out Nick Pavetta because nothing screams America's pastime than putting highly skilled, highly paid, somewhat fragile athletes into a position to have them fail time and time again and possibly hurt themselves. It is so pointless. It is so futile. It is the baseball equivalent of expecting help from city planning. So let me tell my friends out there, those sports fans, if you want to see hitters flail helplessly at pitches, I will happily send you video of a softball game a few years ago between the mayor's office and the New York City Press Corps, a game, uh, obviously, which we won. Uh, although I have to say, in truth, those Lemire boys, they have game. Uh, and, of course, we can send you video of uh, our game against the city council at Richmond County Ballpark when the council came into my backyard as an alum and did not ask me to play for them. And as Michael Jordan once said, I took that personally. <laughs> if you want to see pitchers hit, go to YouTube, type in Bartolo Colon, home run, watch it on a loop again and again and again. I know I've done that mostly after having meetings with city planners. <laughs> I went to college with Pete Harnish, who had a great major league career, had a few opening day starts for the Cincinnati Reds, won 16 games and had an ERA of 2.98 in 1993. 
And in 2004, Pete Harnish hit a 404 foot shot of Brian Dempster off the center field wall. And the boys from Fordham went nuts, not because Pete hit the ball, but because we got to watch Pete waddle down to second base. Lastly, Mr. Mayor, I want to address the issue of expediency. I know some are out there saying that Otto is pulling a Mayor Quimby-like flip-flop and that there is some self-interest involved here. Uh, I am not, uh, I've evolved like other elected officials on important issues have evolved. I've evolved. This has nothing to do with the fact that Dom Smith needs to play every day uh, or anything to do with the construction of the New York Mets lineup or the fact that Zach Gallen, an up-and-coming great young right-hander in the National League, uh, got hurt swinging a bat, and he may or may not be on my fantasy baseball team. So I will close with this, Mr. Mayor. Please send someone to check in on our friend Dersh. He probably has uh, palpitations stronger than when he read my ad in the New York, uh, when the Staten Island advance assailing that monstrosity of a project trying to bring R7 zoning into Staten Island, by the way, city planning complicit in that as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, Borough President, first of all, thank you for your support for this new initiative for Designated Hitter for All, because again, this is now bipartisan. This is something we can unite around. I admire what you just displayed there, tremendous knowledge of the game, uh, passionate Mets fan. Uh, uh, clearly, you have strong feelings about city planning. I did not realize that previously, so I, I understand that now. Uh, but, Borough President, thank you for joining me. As we right a wrong, this is a historic day for New York City. Thank you. And I do want to tell you, Borough President, I have some exciting news for you on another front. Very important news uh, and important for Staten Island. You have been, again, passionately advocating for more vaccine sites in Staten Island, particularly at the South Shore. I am pleased to say thank you for the good work you and your office did with us to find the right site. And I want to formally announce to you that starting on April 8th, next week, at St. Joseph, St. Thomas Parish, we will be having a vaccination site for the South Shore. So thank you for your passionate advocacy. And uh, I, I know you'll have something to say on this, so I pass back to you. Yeah, on a, on a serious note, uh, Mr. Mayor, we have 270 some odd days left. Uh, you know my plea to you, let's maximize it. Uh, we have some big news looming, some big projects we're working on. Uh, it's, it's taken a while. We were frustrated, quite frankly, but we appreciate it. And the good folks on the South Shore have a uh, facility now right in their backyard, and we thank you for that. And uh, hey, listen, uh, good luck to the Boston Red Sox. Uh, you're going to need it. Well, good luck to the, I'm going to ignore that and say good luck to the New York Mets. Congratulations on Francisco Lindor. I hope you have a really great year. And with our new initiative, I have no question you'll have an even better year. Thank you, Borough President Thank Otto. You, sir. We'll Thank you, you so soon. much. All right, now, opening day is good news, as we said, but it's not the only good news. Uh, we have some great news in terms of continued progress on vaccinations. Today's number is. Again, really climbing all the time. 4,134,399 vaccinations given from day one. And we are expecting a lot more supply soon. That's what we need. In the meantime, we're focusing on equity. We're focusing on bringing vaccinations to the grassroots. And that's why you're going to see a lot more sites as part of our effort to reach public housing residents. So these pop-up sites and different developments have been incredibly effective. We're going to be doing a lot more this weekend. So in the Bronx at Castle Hill Houses and Forest Community Center in Brooklyn at Van Dyke Community Center, Manhattan, St. Nicholas Houses, Johnson Houses, Gompers Community Center, Queens at Jacob Reese Community Center, we're going to continue to deepen this grassroots effort. We find it is what helps people feel comfortable with vaccination as if it's in their own development in their own community. So you're going to see a lot more of that, a lot happening this weekend. Now, in continuing our effort for equity, we continue to move resources where they're need needed most. And yesterday I was out in Brownsville, Brooklyn, a community that's been through so much and has rarely gotten its fair share. And we're trying to right a wrong yesterday by investing in Brownsville, an amazing renovation at Betsy Head Park, a historic park in Brownsville, a $30 million effort that's going to do so much to help 
the Brownsville community move forward and help our whole recovery. So focusing on open space is a big part of the recovery for all of us. And today I'm pleased to announce something that's going to be great uh, for New Yorkers all over the five boroughs, especially for Brooklynites we have good news because we're announcing that Governor's Island will be reopening for visitors on May 1st. And Governor's Island, absolutely beautiful, a jewel of New York City. Last year, the opening was delayed because of COVID. This year, we're able to open on time. That's good news. And for the first time, the Governor's Island Ferries will have two stops in Brooklyn for the weekend service that will be provided, Brooklyn Bridge Park and Red Hook. And we want to make sure that people have access to Governor's Island. And we talk about recovery for all of us. We mean all of us. We want to make sure that folks can get to a beautiful place like Governor's Island. So for uh, public housing residents, the ferry rides will be free. For seniors, free. Children, free. Anyone with an IDNYC card, the rides will be free. We want to make sure people get to experience the wonder of Governor's Island. We're all looking forward to a beautiful spring and summer. And part of our recovery will be enjoying everything about this city again, especially outdoors. So this is good news all around. Okay, this week, such an important time of year for so many New Yorkers. It's Holy Week for people of Christian faith. This is an extraordinarily important, deeply felt time of year. It's Passover. I wish Aziz and Pesach to all members of the Jewish community. It's a, a special time, a very important time. It's an important time in terms of faith. Uh, it's an important time in terms of family. And as everyone's planning their gatherings, especially their Easter gatherings, I want to wish everyone a very happy Easter and a, a time of renewal and hope and rebirth, but it's also a time to be safe because we love this time of year and we love when our families gather, but we got to do it the right way. Remember, I know it's been tough. I know 2020 was extraordinarily tough. We missed so many of our traditions and rituals. We missed the big family gatherings. I have such beautiful memories of Easter gatherings in my family, one of the most beautiful times of year. But this is the last time we have to go through this because we will beat COVID once and for all during 2021. And then in 2022, all of our gatherings can go back to what they were. And I can't wait for that. I know you all feel the same way. But this year, let's focus on safety because we want everyone who is with us this year to still be with us next year. So we got to focus on the safety of our family members, particularly our elders. Here to give you tips for any family gatherings, everything you do this special time of year, the city's doctor, Dr. Dave Choksi. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. And I want to first extend warm holiday wishes uh, to all those who are celebrating this weekend. Whether you're celebrating Passover or Easter, I wish you a joyful, but most importantly, a healthy holiday. To make it the safest that it can possibly be, I urge you to follow some very simple but important advice. If you are going to have a gathering, keep it small, optimally limited to members of your own household, and keep it outdoors if at all possible. I know we all want to celebrate with our families and with our loved ones. We all want to be united again, and we will be soon, but our unity in the fight against COVID is the most important thing right now. And remember that the virus hitches a ride on our relationships. If you do choose to celebrate in person, please wear a snug fitting face covering and keep distance. This is particularly important to protect older adults and other people who may be more vulnerable. Fully vaccinated people can gather with other fully vaccinated people with fewer precautions. But remember, most people remain unvaccinated, and you are not considered fully vaccinated until 14 days after your last dose. Many New Yorkers are marking painful one-year anniversaries of those dark days last spring. Let's do everything we can to ensure that the future is indeed brighter than that past. So even though we are all tired, now is not the time to let our guard down. Since we're in the midst of March Madness, uh, let me try to put it this way. You don't stop playing defense until that last buzzer sounds. The next few weeks will be an absolutely crucial time in this public health crisis. 
we're seeing a worryingly high level of cases. And as we reported yesterday, new variants are making up an increasing share of those cases, over 70% of all specimens sequenced for the most recent week. As the weather gets nicer, our vaccine supply increases, and our historic vaccination campaign ramps up to an even higher level. We must continue to follow the public health guidance we've been talking about for so long now. Wear a mask, maintain distance from uh, those who are not in your household, stay home if you're sick, wash your hands, get tested regularly, and get the vaccine when you are eligible. Stay safe and happy holidays. Back to you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you so much, Dr. Choksi. Really appreciate the advice you're giving everyone. Everyone have beautiful holidays. Uh, I want it to be a special time for all New Yorkers, but let's keep safe. And I like your analogy, your March Madness analogy. Play until the final buzzer sounds. Excellent advice to all of us. All right, let's talk about our indicators. Number one, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Today's report, 194 patients. Again, that's a good sign, but long way to go. Confirmed positivity, 59.8%. Hospitalization rate, 3.84 per 100,000. Number two, new reported cases on a seven-day average. Today's report, 3,491 cases. And number three, percentage of people testing positive citywide for COVID-19. Today's report on a seven-day rolling average, 6.64%. Okay, we're gonna do a few words in Spanish, and we'll talk about the guidance that we're giving for the holidays, how to keep families safe. La Pascua está cerca, pero el COVID sigue entre nosotros. Todavía hay que cuidar los unos a los otros, especialmente a nuestros familiares y a los ancianos. Por favor, hay que mantener sus reuniones pequeñas y ponerse la vacuna lo más pronto posible. With that, we turn to our colleagues in the media. Please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. We'll now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, we're joined today by Dr. Choksi, by Dr. Long, by Claire Newman, the President and CEO of the Trust for Governors Island, and by Senior Advisor, Dr. Jay Varma. The first question today goes to Roger Stern from 1010 Winds. Roger. Roger. Roger, can you hear us? All right, we'll go back to Roger. Okay. First question today goes to Marsha Kramer from WCBS. Mr. Mayor, a uh, long time no speak. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Marsha. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. And I really appreciated your April Fool's joke. Um, my question today is, is, is no joke. It's a question about the homeless and what your administration plans to do as we come back from COVID. What plans do you have for opening homeless shelters from homeless shelters to permanent housing and getting them the mental health they so desperately need? It's such an important question, Marcia. Thank you. Uh, we absolutely are planning to, uh, first of all, ensure that folks uh, who have been in hotels go back into shelter settings because shelter settings are where people can get the proper mental health support. Uh, so we will be doing that, the first available opportunity. Uh, continuing to deepen efforts to address mental health challenges as we find them. Um, we have more and more teams we put together that can do rapid response uh, with anyone who's seriously mentally ill. We'll be talking about that a lot more in the coming days. Um, I want to say everyone, health department, health and hospitals has been working in coordination with homeless services to make sure that any situation where someone is troubled, that they get assessed quickly and they get the mental health services they need. This is an ongoing challenge, but we're going to throw everything we got at it. Go ahead, Marsha. I just wonder if you have plans to open um, a, a sort of assisted living housing where um, the homeless can live in apartments, but also get social services and mental health that they need. And how large a scope is it? Did your original home help helping the homeless plan have to be put on the shelf because of COVID? And will you be able to revive for, um, before too long? Yeah, no, I'll, that's a great question. Thank you, Marcia. No, the plan that we put forward 
A uh, few months before COVID hit, the Journey Home Plan uh, is active. We are implementing it as we speak. In fact, during COVID, we found, even with the challenge of COVID, that we were able to get hundreds and hundreds of homeless people off the streets and get them into shelter and keep them in the shelter uh, with the safe haven approach, uh, with the closing of the subways at night, which was very productive, with sending out outreach workers. And outreach workers were heroic. Even amidst the COVID, they went out, they engaged homeless folks, they got them in. That continues, and we're now going to be able to ramp that up a lot more as we are fighting back COVID. And supportive housing, what you referred to a moment ago. Uh, housing for folks who have been homeless, who have mental health problems, who need services. We've been expanding supportive housing even as COVID has continued. We put together a plan for 15,000 supportive housing apartments. That plan is moving and it's now going to be able to move a lot quicker uh, as we recover. So all of those efforts are going to deepen. We need them all. And this is part of, uh, I think, an important part of our recovery. Still waiting on Roger, so we're going to go to Kristen Dalton from, from the Staten Island Advance. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the South Shore announcement. You know, you stole one of my questions. I was going to ask you about it. <laughs> I say no, Kristen, look at the bright side. I saved you a question. So I'm happy to and thank you for continuing to remind us that we had more work to do there and we found the right site and it will be open next week. I'm really happy about that. Yeah, the, the people of Staten Island, thank you for that. It was definitely um, needed. But I, I wanted to ask you about um, appointments. Um, so it looks like uh, there's some restrictions on the vaccine finder website, specifically the Ocean Breeze location, which says appointments are restricted by age and zip code. Um, I know that residents, you know, 30 and over are now eligible and as well as the announcement that New Yorkers can go to any location. So I'm just wondering why there are still some restrictions for appointments. I'll start and I'll turn to uh, Dr. Choksi and Dr. Long. Uh, Kristen, we, we want to make access uh, as easy and universal as possible. But I also want to note, and I, I think the doctors will back me up, we are still most concerned about those who are oldest and those with pre-existing conditions. Those are still the most vulnerable folks. Uh, so whenever there is a preference given uh, for older folks, for example, that's for purely medical reasons. And we're also, of course, trying to address uh, many of the areas where we've seen COVID hit the hardest and have the most devastating results. Uh, so that's why we find some of those preference structures are important. But the real goal, uh, Kristen, is to just have more and more supply and go deeper and deeper into communities, to Staten Island and all communities, with more and more hours and be able to reach more people. We still don't have anywhere near the supply we need. And so that's why it's important to keep some of our focus on the folks who are most vulnerable. Dr. Choksi. Yes, well, the, the mayor said it well um, and covered the important points here. Um, first, it's important to understand that eligibility has uh, widened uh, quite a bit. So there are now millions of New Yorkers who are eligible for vaccination. And remember, that's a great thing um, because we want as many uh, people to get vaccinated as possible. Uh, but second, just as the mayor has said, we do know that um, vaccination is most important for people who are most at risk either because they are older or have some other um, type of medical vulnerability to severe COVID-19 disease, um, or because they come from a neighborhood that has been hardest hit during the pandemic. Uh, and so we are um, doing these things to ensure that people are adequately prioritized according to those health and equity considerations. The final thing that I'll say is that um, despite that, uh, we do want to make sure that uh, not a single appointment goes to waste. So if we're finding that uh, that appointments are not um, being booked, then those do get um, opened up to uh, broader tranches of eligibility so that every single dose of vaccine um, gets into someone's arm as soon as possible. Thank you. Dr. Long, you want to add? Yeah, I would just add um, that we have a focus on ensuring that we can remove all barriers to vaccinate as many of our seniors as possible. Right now, you mentioned age. We have a new walk-up program at our City Field, Bathgate, and Brooklyn Army Terminal sites, where if you're 75 or above, you don't even need an appointment. You can come anytime. They're open 24-7. You can even bring an escort with you, and if that escort is eligible, we'll vaccinate both of you. No appointment needed. We're going to continue that focus because it is so important to vaccinate our most vulnerable New Yorkers and to tear down every single barrier in order to accomplish that as quickly and safely as possible. Thank you. Go ahead, Kristen. 
Great, thank you so much. Um, and I just wanted to uh, ask about an update for the timeline of the uh, mass vaccination site at Empire Outlets. I know you said that the supply would be increasing. Um, you know, we haven't really seen anything yet this week. Um, and and to to Dr. Long's point, you know, is uh, Empire Outlets a good candidate for maybe a 75 and older walk up site uh, as that supply increases? The, I'll, I'll turn to uh, Dr. Choksi and Dr. Long, uh, whoever has the best update on the timeline. We, again, we intend to do more for sure with Empire Outlets. It's a great site. As we're getting more supply, we want to uh, make sure there's more and more appointments. Uh, and so I'll just say that, and I'll say on the walk-up uh, point, uh, Kristen, it's, we're piloting it now in just a few locations. Really want to see if it will work and encourage seniors to get appointments who haven't gotten them yet. We are also watching carefully to make sure we don't end up with a different kind of problem, which is lines. And you've raised good concerns about lines and putting seniors in a tough situation. And obviously, we're concerned about people being in close proximity. So we're piloting it over these next few days to decide where to go. If we think it'll work, then we'll talk about uh, how far we want to go with it and which sites would be uh, the best. But in terms of uh, the build out of more appointments at Empire, um, Dr. Toxie, Dr. Long, who wants to speak to that? Uh, yes, I can start briefly, sir. Um, just to say that uh, that appointments are contingent on uh, supply, as the mayor has said. Um, we are here on the first day of April, and April is the month where we do expect a significant uh, uptick in, in the supply allocated to us from the federal government. Over the last um, couple of weeks, we've seen more modest increases, and we expect by the end of the month um, for those uh, increases in supply to get much more significant for New York City. As that additional vaccine uh, comes in, we will ramp up uh, appointment availability at Empire Outlets and other sites. So I expect you'll start seeing a noticeable difference by uh, the middle of the month um, and then a marked difference by the end of the month. Thank you. Next we'll go. Yeah, the, uh, oh. What do you got? Do you have Roger? Just, talk to him just real fast. Oh, Ted, go ahead. I'm sorry, Ted, go ahead. Just to be clear, um, and I appreciate your advocacy for Staten Island, Empire Outlets is open now. And as Dr. Choksi said, we're going to be ramping up as we get more supply over the next two weeks. Uh, but it is open, um, which we're very excited about because this is such an important thing for Staten Island. And I appreciate your suggestion about having us consider walk-ups at Empire Outlets too. So we will consider that. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Next, we'll go back to Roger Stern from 1010 Winds. Hi, Mayor. Good afternoon. Good morning, I should say. How are you doing? I'm doing good, Roger. How are you doing? I'm great. I have two questions involving uh, the vaccine. One of them is the, the controversial issue of vaccine passports. Uh, how do you feel about them, especially when it comes to reopening Broadway, being able to have more people in movie theaters and uh, at sporting events? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'll start and I'll turn to Dr. Varma. I, I think that passports could be an important part of our recovery. Uh, we got to get it right. We've got to respect people's privacy. Uh, we got to make sure that the system is accurate. There's definitely more to be worked through. But I think they'll be part of the solution. Uh, I think rapid testing is part of the solution as well. In fact, Dr. Varma and I spoke to a wide range of leaders of the Broadway community and the theater and cultural community a few days ago. And this is one of the things that's really exciting to people, these different tools that are going to help them bring back audiences. And when the time comes, and I'm really looking forward to September in particular, bring back larger audiences because you'll be able to know exactly who's been vaccinated or who just got a test and tested negative. Dr. Varma, you want to speak to that? Yeah, I, I would echo exactly what the mayor has said. You know, we know that uh, it's going to be really important to achieve the recovery for all of us that uh, people uh, feel safe. They feel as if the places that they're going indoors that we've been telling them for so long to avoid doing are actually going to be places where they can go back and return and enjoy the activities that they've had for us. And so part of that assurance includes uh, verification that people are either immune through vaccination or if they haven't been vaccinated, uh, that they show evidence that they are not infected, such as through the use of a rapid test. I don't think these are going to be required everywhere. 
but it certainly makes sense for private businesses to require these um, as a way to ensure that when we return everybody back to these shared indoor spaces, um, that those activities can be done in a way that is uh, enjoyable and productive and not at risk of uh, transmitting infection. Thank you. Go ahead, Roger. Yeah, the other question is, for people who are vaccinated and want to socialize with other people who are vaccinated, the guidance is still fairly restricted, not too many people in your home. That may reduce the incentive for people to get the vaccine, people who are reluctant to get it. Should the guidance be more liberal when it comes to contact between vaccinated people? Uh, you came in, came in and out a little bit there sound quality wise. Dr. Choksi, did you hear it well enough to answer? Yes, I believe I did. Sure. The, the question, sir, was about um, uh, how we should think about um, people who are vaccinated interacting with other people who are vaccinated. Um, it's an important question. And, um, you know, I want to be candid that, that we expect uh, these guidelines to change over time as more and more people get uh, vaccinated and we see the protection that that affords. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, you'll start to see uh, some um, relax uh, relaxation of, of the guidelines further. Um, but there are some very important provisos that I want to make sure to communicate as part of this. First um, is the notion of being fully vaccinated. That means you're either 14 days after your second dose of the Moderna or Pfizer vaccines or 14 days after your J&J &J vaccine. So it's not the case that you're uh, considered vaccinated or protected just a few days after getting the first dose of any of the vaccines. Um, that's important to keep in mind. Uh, the second part of it is, remember, part of getting uh, vaccinated is not just about protecting yourself. It's about protecting others. The same way that we have um, encouraged people to wear masks, both to protect themselves as well as others, is how we should be thinking about vaccination as well. And right now, particularly with the level of transmission where it is in New York City, it is very important for all of us, including people who have been vaccinated, to continue following the precautions that we're advising. Thank you. Go ahead. The next is Henry from Bloomberg. Well, Mr. Mayor, are you going to Yankee Stadium today? But that's not my question, but I'm going to ask you. No, we will anyway. not count that question. No, everything's, everything's virtual they're doing today, except for uh, folks who are just going to enjoy the game. So there's no, no ceremony I'll be a part of, but I am happy they're back. And Henry, I expect you to do a very extensive article on our new initiative uh, to bring fairness and justice to pitchers everywhere. Uh, I was I was noticing uh, Borough President Otto's remarks there. He was much more of a troll than I've been, but I, so I salute <laughs> him for that. All right, um, what do you got today? Well, I want to get back to this question of passports because it's becoming a bit of a political football with uh, some people, mainly Republicans, questioning whether government should be making these rules that would dictate people's behavior and, you know, kind of insist that they be vaccinated. And their, their argument is that it creates a kind of two classes of people, those who are and those who aren't. Um, and I'm just wondering where you stand on that. Should this be a decision of private businesses, office buildings, restaurants, theaters, arenas, or should government actually be uh, making these regulations? Well, I'll start and I want to get Dr. Varma back in. <clears throat> Look, Henry, this is something, it, it is definitely complex. We got to think it through. I think we're still at the phase now where our most foundational concerns are getting people vaccinated and, and making sure people stick to the smart guidance that keeps them safe and really reinforcing that and acting on that. But look, I see the passport approach as another tool. I, I think it's one of many tools. And I respect folks who choose not to get vaccinated and, and we'll work with that as well. But I think particularly for some private sector settings, it could be a really valuable tool. I think government has a role to play in setting it up and making it work. But again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make it more 
than it is. I think the most important thing is to get people vaccinated, get people to follow healthy habits, uh, put smart health and safety measures in place uh, in all parts of our society as we fight our way out of this. Go ahead, Dr. Varma. Yeah, I, I would concur with what the mayor has said, and, and I agree that there's a lot of specifics about these things that need to be taken uh, to be addressed. So let's go through just a couple of critical issues. First of all, I don't think we should be requiring that people show proof of vaccination until vaccines are, are widely available uh, to everybody. Um, and, and, and that includes, you know, right now we are, you know, our biggest issue is supply right now. And so we need to get to a point where, you know, uh, vaccines are widely abundant, available, and people have all been reached and, and, and given the information they need to make an informed decision. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, as the mayor said, I, I do think we need to uh, think carefully about what the role of government is in this versus what the role of the private sector is in this. I think it's absolutely critical for government to assist in making sure that there are standards, that there's uniform and fair application of these when they're used. Um, but but we also, need, and, and I think related to that, we also need to make sure that that is not the only pathway for you to receive services. Again, an alternative pathway is similar to what we do in healthcare facilities, where all healthcare providers in inpatient facilities are required to uh, get an influenza vaccination every year. And if they choose not to get that vaccine, they have to follow certain protective measures. And in, in some situations, even have to have identification attached to their ID badge. Um, I, I'm not saying that that's what we would do in this situation, but I'm just saying that there's a model uh, that can be followed for these things. Um, so I think we're going to have to, to, to adjudicate this, obviously, with the court of public opinion, with the laws. Um, of our country, but I do think it is a pathway that needs to be strongly considered um, because, again, it's going to be very important uh, for people to have the assurance that when they participate in activities that we have been telling them for over a year are very high risk, that there is actually a way to do those activities um, that ensures that they are actually more likely to be safe than to be harmed. Thank you. Go ahead, Henry. Okay. Henry. Okay. Um, my Next question has to do with the city's role in opening up theaters. Uh, it's kind of related to this passport question because central to it is uh, the confidence that an audience uh, might have in attending a theater. Is the city going to assist theaters in any way in uh, uh, controlling the audience or weeding out the audience for vaccination or helping theaters financially uh, get ready for a reopening. All of these buildings have been shut for months. Uh, or is it really on the theaters and they will use whatever federal assistance has been uh, you know, created through these st uh, stimulus funds? Now, we're going to be active participants helping the theater community come back. Uh, obviously, the announcement last week, Henry, that we are going to provide vaccination centers and mobile vaccination uh, specifically aimed at the theater community, the cultural community. Uh, we're doing that proactively. We're going to help them figure out uh, crowd management. Uh, we're going to provide uh, medical advice and support as they're figuring out their plans. Uh, we're certainly looking at ways that we can be helpful materially. I think you're right, the federal aid is crucial, but there's other things that uh, we might be able to do. This is exactly why we had a, a really big kind of summit meeting with uh, members of the cultural community leadership to think through these approaches. And again, for what we're ultimately talking about, you know, Broadway, using Broadway as an example, coming back full strength, you know, that's September or so that we're looking at now. There's a lot of time to do that work and plan together. Uh, but we need them to come back. We absolutely need them to come back. So we're going to be shoulder to shoulder. We're going to partner with them to get it done. The next is Matt Chase from Newsday. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah. That April Fool's gag was uh, inner circle level funny. You know, Matt, that is a true compliment if, you know, I know, I know you're a devotee of the inner circle. So if I've reached that pantheon, I want to really, I'm, I'm feeling good today. But I, I, I where I'll, do you I'll stand? You, where I'll, do you stand you on the issue? 
I'll, I'll let you decide whether that's a compliment. No, I'll take it as a compliment. But um, Matt, Matt, I want to, I'm going to be the journalist now. Where do you stand on the designated hitter? You know, uh, I, I report and, and you decide. I'm oh, not going to wow. take a stand. I don't want to, I don't want to wade in between you and Steve and, and, and Nolan and, and Gersh. So, um, I, I got two today for, for Dr. Varma. Um, the, the first is, why are states like Arizona, Mississippi, Texas, which dropped mask mandates and, and lifted gathering restrictions, all trending down in infections and, and other metrics, uh, and, and yet we've plateaued? In, in Texas's case, the mandates were dropped almost three weeks ago. So what falsified falsifiable evidence would you need to say uh, to, to see that we're doing something, that they're doing something right, but that New York isn't doing? Dr. Varma. Yeah, no, it's a, a great question. It, it requires a much longer answer than we can do during this press conference, but I, I really want to be very clear because this, this issue keeps coming up. If there was a simple preventive measure other than vaccinations available uh, for COVID, then we would have figured it out. But what we have said repeatedly over and over again is that the best way to prevent COVID before we had vaccines and, and even until everybody gets vaccinated is multiple interventions done together, all of which are imperfect, but all need to be added up together. So if you want to answer the question the way you phrase it, like a falsifiable hypothesis, you have to account for every single factor that relates to COVID transmission. One of those is not just the policies on mask wearing, but it's where are people wearing them, what people are actually wearing them, and how frequently they're using it. So that's masks. But you also have to account for distance, which includes the density of your population. You have to account for frequency of hand washing, because we know some things can be transmitted by person to person. You have to account for ventilation. You have to account for climatic conditions. So there are many, many factors that determine why some populations have higher rates than others. And then you have to also get into the much more complicated questions about the, the completeness of testing and recording and reporting of all of those things. And we know, for example, that in New York, we test per capita, as Ted can, as Ted can talk about separately, you know, higher than any other jurisdiction on a regular basis. So, so I, I, you know, I'll stop there because it's much harder to answer. But basically, the answer is to say, I know it would be nice to be able to give a simple answer that says, well, cases are going down here and they're not going there. Therefore, it's due to a policy. No, that's not actually the case. Um, you need to have much, much deeper information so we know that. I think that is, before we go back to Matt, Dr. Varma, I think that's a fantastic answer. And I think that last point, um, we are going out of our way to test a lot of people and be very transparent with the results. I think a big question in other parts of the country is, are we seeing the whole picture given the level of testing? Are we actually getting the whole truth or not? Go ahead, Matt. Oh, well, before I get to the second question, I would love to hear the more complete answer offline. Um, but on to the second one, um, which steps or components in the ordinary FDA approval process are missing for the coronavirus vaccines to, uh, to be approved by the FDA with, with regard to safety, not durability, beyond a, an emergency authorization use? And if nothing, why haven't the vaccines been approved yet? Which, which vaccines? I want to make sure we're not missing you, Matt. What, what, what are you saying specifically? All of them. Okay, go ahead, Dr. Uh, Varma. Moderna. Yeah, what, what Matt's getting at is the difference between an emergency use authorization uh, versus an approval. And um, there are basically, you know, as you note, that all of the steps that were used for um, authorization can also be used for approval. I, I confess that I actually don't know all of the regulatory uh, differences um, that are needed. My understanding has generally been that there is um, a larger packet of information that is needed uh, for the, first of all, for the, author, uh, for the approval process, and second of all, a longer term of follow-up in terms of the vaccines themselves. But, but we can look into that to, to get you the exact information. But yes, there is a distinction between these vaccines that are officially authorized by the FDA. They are not yet officially approved. Thank you. Go ahead. Next is Steve Burns from WCBS 880. Hey, Mr. Mayor. Happy opening day to you and yours. Happy opening day, Steve. How are you feeling today? I'm good. Always a, a sense of optimism on, on day one here before, before reality sets in for some of our teams. This is, this is a day when all teams are potential winners. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. 
Uh, first question on a, a more serious topic. I'm sure you saw the Times article last night that uh, went into detail on the governor's book deal. Looks to be $4 million. There's a question of whether he used public resources to help put it together. And then there's the issue of the three-page long broadside, as the Times put it, that was included in a first draft where uh, he said, you have very little interest uh, in governmental operations. Uh, you have obvious ego-driven narcissism, uh, annoying and counterproductive. I wanted to get your take on those words and, in general, the, the book deal as we have more details on it. Well, Steve, first of all, I think you see every day uh, the level of focus I bring to all these issues we're facing, and I'm deeply committed to leading us in this recovery, and um, that's what I'm about. I'm not going to focus on petty insults. Uh, the, the issue here is a profound one. This is what we're hearing now in this new report. The facts that have been laid out by the Times indicates very clearly a pattern of corruption, pure and simple, a clear, consistent pattern of corruption. The governor wanted to personally profit and politically profit from his book deal. He covered up the truth about the nursing home scandal, and his team covered up the truth, to benefit himself financially and politically. That's what we're seeing. He inappropriately used government staff to further his own personal aims. I mean, it's in great detail there. This requires a full investigation. Uh, the uh, impeachment investigation now needs to look into this. Uh, uh, and the federal investigation, the attorney general's investigation, now they have to add corruption related to the book deal and misuse of public staff and public funds on top of the deaths of thousands of people who were in the nursing homes, the cover-up of those deaths, uh, the fact that there have been numerous instances of sexual harassment and sexual molestation, uh, the scandal related to the Tappan Zee Bridge, uh, every day we learn something new, but it's all one clear pattern of corruption. That's what we're seeing. Go ahead, Steve. Thanks. And given that the kind of numerous allegations here and that there's still more adding up, uh, obviously this is a very important time of year for New York State as they're still putting the budget together. Uh, do you feel like the process has at all slowed down in terms of holding the governor accountable and the assembly uh, is still looks like it's in the beginning stages of its impeachment investigation. Uh, would you go as far as to make the call to, to speed up the process to hold this governor accountable? I have a lot of respect for the Assembly and the work they're doing right now and the whole legislature. Thank God they're there. I mean, they're leading the state right now. Uh, Speaker Carl he Hasty and um, Majority Leader Andrea Stewart-Cousins, they are leading the state of New York. They are holding things together. As I've said, the governor should resign because at this point he cannot lead and he, he cannot keep the faith of the people anymore. So clearly uh, it's creating distraction, it's creating confusion, and we need to move forward, especially as we're fighting the coronavirus. Um, but I think that I have a lot of faith that the legislature and the assembly will, you know, they will figure out the timing that makes sense. They've got a lot to cover, though, Steve. I mean, this is, I'm sorry to have to say this, but look at Every day we hear new revelations that require their own investigations to get to the truth. This is a lot that has to be unraveled, but it all points in the same direction. Just blatant corruption that the governor got away with for years. And then on top of it, you know, what we're seeing now about the impact of campaign uh, donations. Well, what happened with the nursing home industry and the cover-up? How much was it related to campaign donations from the nursing home industry, from the big hospital systems? And obviously, some very good reporting lately. You know, he received a uh, huge amount of donations from billionaires, from billionaires directly. And he has been the number one reason why we haven't had fair taxation of the wealthy in New York State for years. And I tried to get him to do a tax on the wealthy in 2014. He fought it with all he's got. Why? We're now seeing more and more because his pockets were lined by billionaires. So all of this needs to be investigated. We have time for two more for today. The next is Dana from the New York Times. Hi, Mr. Mayor. Um, some, if not most, of the people targeting Asian Americans in these attacks 
involve people who are mentally Ill, Ill, maybe homeless, and frequently involved with the criminal justice system. Is the city doing anything different to address that aspect of the hate crime phenomenon? Uh, everything that we're doing on a policing level recognizes that we're seeing some patterns. It's not the only thing that's happening here, Dana, but we are seeing some patterns. That's why uh, the Asian Hate Crimes Task Force is using undercover officers and decoy officers. Uh, we're obviously focused geographically where uh, we think there might be attacks to try and prevent them. Um, that is part of the approach. But I think there's another piece that has to be um, pulled out and put in the open here. Um, the horrible attack uh, it, on West 43rd Street, a state parolee, an indicator of the fact, and this is something that we've tried to bring to light for years, I know Commissioner Shea's tried to bring to light, but it, it has not gotten the attention it deserved. Now maybe uh, that the imperial uh, governorship is being challenged that we're going to see a different discussion on this topic. The parole system in New York State does not work, takes people coming out of prison, including folks who have committed violent crimes, dumps them in New York City with no plan, no housing, no job, no mental health support. Uh, the state just dumps the challenge on the city, no coordination and it creates tremendous problems. And it has to be changed. And it's time to have a very different discussion. It's time to hold the state of New York responsible for their parolees and for actually providing the services that will give us a chance of avoiding these horrible situations. Go ahead, Dana. Thanks, and just to follow up, are you doing anything to sort of focus on that nexus between mental health and hate crime? Is there anything the city can do? We have been focusing for years on the nexus between um, serious and documented mental health challenges and violence. Remember, this is a very small number of people. Uh, the vast majority of people who have a mental health challenge are, of course, not violent. But there's a small number who have a documented mental health challenge and have a documented history of violence. With those folks, we have a, a very aggressive follow-up structure. But in some cases, we see someone committing a crime who never has before or someone who didn't have a documented uh, mental health challenge. It's, it's not a simple, clear pattern. So it is a combination of trying to identify folks with mental health challenges, get them support. It is a, a case of trying to be as proactive and preventative in terms of the policing element of this. Uh, it does not present itself as a, you know, a clean, consistent pattern, but we're trying with all the tools we have to get ahead of it in any way possible. And again, want to emphasize, stopping the hate crimes is just, it's all of us have to be a part of it. And anyone who needs more information on how to participate, how to support the Asian American community right now, please go to nyc.gov slash stop Asian hate. Go ahead. Last question for today goes to Gersh from Streets Blog. Well, Mr. Mayor, thank you for taking me clean up again. I, you know, I always ask you about street safety issues and how we, we can reduce road violence, but I know that you, as a mayor, want to make front page news all the time, but let's, I, I know you were kidding about the DH thing, but let's make some back page news today because I honestly believe that as sports writers, true, and obviously one more gifted than I am, should make some news with this thing about the designated hitter rule. In all seriousness, you are a baseball fan. I do respect that about you, but this, contention that the designated hitter rule needs to come to the National League is, is bizarre to me, given that you are a purist about the game. So can, in all seriousness, I believe you need to, for the record, explain why you want to desecrate our national pastime with a rule that changes one of the most basic parts of the game, which is all players should hit. Gersh, I think there, you know, <clears throat> our belief in a respectful, tolerant, a New York City that respects all people, all belief structures, includes uh, traditionalists like you lost in another time who don't understand progress. And so this is what I would say. I do remember when the designated hitter first came to the American League. You are a student of the game. The, the Boston Red Sox had Orlando Cepeda, who the only thing he could do was hit. He could barely run anymore. His knees were shot. But he really could hit. And it was kind of exciting. And it was a lot more fun than watching a pitcher strike out, which was inevitably pretty much what happened. 
So I long ago, I started being a traditionalist purist, but then I had the experience of seeing how the designated hitter made more sense. Now, Gersh, here is my serious answer for today's game. People getting injured all the time. It's unbelievable. True baseball fans, you have each of you have your own example. Jimmy Otto gave his example. Mine is Stephen Wright, pitcher for the Red Sox a few years ago, knuckleballer. He was doing great. He was having an all-star caliber season. They sent him in inexplicably as a pinch runner. And uh, he injured his knee, and he's never been the same since. It's just we are losing too many pitchers to injury the way conditioning and all works nowadays. So my honest answer is protect the pitchers, uh, allow them to do what they do, don't make them do something they can't do, and make the game more interesting because as a true baseball believer, we are competing against a lot of other sports. We've got to keep the game relevant and interesting and more hitting, more action, more excitement. So there is my passionate argument. And Gersh, I hope you're going to give full coverage to our new initiative. I have to say, I hope a sports writer is listening because th there are so many holes in that answer. But I do have a serious question today uh, because I don't want to uh, make it all about baseball, although I'm excited about opening day. So uh, this morning, controller Stringer uh, sent a letter to the MTA uh, kind of demanding that the MTA ensure that these contractors who have been providing all this subway cleaning overnight, you know, there was a report that they are not being paid prevailing wages and they're not having benefits the same way a union contractor would uh, with the MTA. So, and I, I think you've addressed the issue of the need, the need for the cleanliness in the subway, and, and, and that's certainly understood, but the, the workers' rights here. I wonder if you could address that a little bit. I'm sure you uh, probably, I, I'd like to think you share uh, Controller Stringer's concerns for workers' rights. Oh, I deeply care about workers' rights. It's something I've worked on for years, and um, I want to make sure everyone is treated fairly, safely, fairly compensated, especially people doing such vital work to protect the rest of us. I haven't seen the report, and I don't know the details, but I would say clearly the decision which I strongly supported to have some hours when the subway was shut down during the COVID crisis to clean the subways better, to help people feel safer, come back to the subways, because our future is mass transit. There's no question. Uh, that was a very good initiative. And the folks who did the work did something wonderful for all of us. So they deserve fairness. Um, but that is an example of a decision that worked <clears throat> that's going to help us as part of our recovery. And so uh, I will conclude today with this, that, you know, this, this week and particularly this weekend coming up, you know, a time to focus on renewal, a time to focus on rebirth. Uh, this is, if ever there was a week that's a metaphor for recovery, it's this one. The, the spiritual importance of this week and, of course, of course, for so many of us, opening day of baseball as well. It all points in one direction. We're coming back. And we're coming back. And we're going to come back together. We're going to make sure this is a recovery for all of us. It is a very exciting time. It's a very hopeful time. But everyone, please stay safe. Be there for each other. Do the thing that New Yorkers do. Be compassionate and kind to each other. Support each other. Let's go through this week. Keep it safe. And let's move forward to a recovery for this city. Thank you, everyone.